Chapter 17, beginning with verse 15. I'm reading from the King James Version. Won't you follow along in the text before you? And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and received the commandment unto Silas and Timothy for to come to him with all speed. They departed. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met met with him. Still talking about Jews and, and Gentiles that are going to the synagogue. Verse 18. Then certain philosophers, the Epicureans and of the Stoics, encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, seemed to be a a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the strangers which were um, spent their time at, which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. And he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that... um, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in the temples made with hands. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands, such as through the need of anything, seeing he given to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before the appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also, um, also of your own prophets have said, excuse me, poets, your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by the art and man's device. And the times of his ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. Let's stop there and let's go to the Lord in prayer, preparing our hearts for the study of God's word. Give each believer in Jesus Christ the opportunity to confess all known sin before the Father and then ask that God might teach you. This is done in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, it's with a sense of satisfaction that we come before you right now with open Bibles before us, that we might study your word, that we might learn more about your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
that we might grow in our understanding of Him in such a way that your Holy Spirit might be able to use us, endow us with the um, challenge to reach others for a saving knowledge of your Son. Father, use us. We want to be bold witnesses. Father, sometimes we're confused as to what we should do. Sometimes we're all alone and we're not sure how to step forward. Thank you, Father, for giving us this um, account of the Apostle Paul when he was alone and how he stepped forward to give an account of salvation to both Jew and Gentile, to your honor and glory. These things we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. We're still going through the second uh, session, session of the second missionary journey that started in chapter 15 and will continue on to chapter 18. We've gotten to number five, and number five is the preaching in Athens, uh, verses 15 through 34. I read a portion of that. We assume <clears throat> from what we read here that Paul and some of the Thessalonian brothers journeyed by ship to Athens. We assume that simply because of the time frame that we see in this text. Yeah, he could have walked, but <laughs> probably there would have been some other things that occurred, stopping in ver various villages and such, but there's no talk of the stopping in villages and such. And he's with a couple Thessalonians who are actually taking him to Athens, finding him a safe place because they know Athens, and leaving him there to go back to Thessalonica. Um, they accompany him. And picture this, I believe, not as a guard. Some of the, some of the uh, commentaries that I had said, they protected him on his way to... What? What is this? Um, I believe that they were guiding him and directing him because he just wouldn't know exactly where in Athens, first trip there, um, where in Athens to go. Paul told those brothers that were with him to instruct Silas and Timothy to join him in Athens as soon as possible. So they, when they left, went back with that information. It's clear in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, that Silas and Timothy did rejoin Paul, and they did in the city of Athens. Silas likewise was commissioned by Paul to leave Athens and then meet him at Corinth. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2, I think you'll see that they indeed did come and join him. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 reads, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Paul came not as a tourist. Get it straight. He came as an evangelist. And as the late Noel Lyons, for many years the director of the Greater Europe Mission, used to say, Europe is looked over by millions of visitors. And it is overlooked by millions of Christians. Oftentimes, we as believers in Jesus Christ, when we're thinking about mission fields, we don't think France, Germany, Austria. We think, well, Christianity came to there you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years ago. So why would we send missionaries now? Because this generation now hasn't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they need to hear if they are to believe. Paul's day... Um, his interest was to get the gospel out. And here he was heading to Athens for that very purpose. Like Paul, we got to have open eyes and yet yeah, broken hearts. He witnessed in the synagogue and he witnessed in the marketplace during the week. Look at verse 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. It reads a little differently in the Greek than it does in our English text there. Some words have some emotive value in our English text there that isn't found in the original. 
In the synagogue, no doubt, he taught from the Old Testament scriptures, pulled out the scrolls and taught from the scrolls that Yeshua, Yeshua from back in Palestine was the Messiah of Israel. And I believe that was his message whenever he went to the synagogue. If you see in verse 2 of the same chapter, And Paul, as his manner was, went unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging, remember, laying side by side, that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ, or the Messiah. He laid side by side. He brought out the Old Testament Scriptures from the scrolls, and then he laid it next to the life of, of Jesus of Nazareth and they could see for themselves that this indeed is prophecy fulfilled in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus. In the synagogue were Jews and God-fearing Gentiles to whom our scripture, our, our uh, English text says disputed with him. I put the word up here and I think you'll recognize it. Dialegomai is uh, the verb and it means to dialogue. It's to, it's two word direction, okay? Someone says something, someone responds to what's being said. They respond to, to, to uh, what it is, and then goes back and forth. Dialogue is speaking one with one another. Dialogue never goes one direction. If it goes one direction, it's called, don't you dare say sermon. <laughs> monologue, right? Monologue going one direction. Dialogue is both directions. So it's a discussion. It's used often in Scripture and brought into our text as the word reason. So he was reasoning with the Jews in the synagogue. But that's just one day of the week. During the rest of the, day, uh, rest of the days of the week, he went out into the marketplace. Um... Greek word there is agora. When you see the word agora, um, maybe you remember it from high school history class or something, it means a marketplace, a Greek marketplace. Um, and as it's used here in the scripture, we, would, we could even specify it down to the city square, the main part of the city. Um, Paul reasoned daily with those that happened to be in the Agora. This is an artist's rendition of the, the Agora in um, Athens. And I'm going to be referring to a few places on this as the scripture does. Understand in this, in this picture, Paul is on this, in this area. And curiously, if you see the uh, the name of the road that goes through the Agora. Do you see that road that's going there? The name of that road is, it says, the Panotheonic Way. The multitude of gods way. And if you take any moment to look into detail in regards to this artist's rendition, you'll see that there were just idols everywhere. And where there wasn't idols, there was a temple. There's so many temples and idols. And here he is. And here he is. He's walking through this. One temple here. That's another temple on the other side of the street. Now look at the, and look at all of these images. This one's to Hermes. This one's to... And he goes down the list looking at all these different gods and their images. And he's watching people come and bring um, offerings before these idols. Kneeling down and bringing their prayer, praying, praying for their kids, praying for their, their job, praying for the situations that are going on. Devoted, as he says in here, devoted to these idols. Um, so, as you glance through there, by the way, I will point out that there's a building right here, almost near the center. You see that? And you'll see it's marked Temple of Ares. 
Areopagus, Ares. Ares is the god of war. Um, Ares is the Greek god of war. The Roman god of war is... I'm sorry? No. Thank you. Mars is the... And curiously, in your English text, you have both of these names given. Areopagus, the stone of Ares, the hill of Ares, and then you have Mars, hill, and the word in there is stone, the stone of Mars. Um, a high place for Mars, or, or high place for Ares is the same thing. It's the god of war that's being um, spoken of there. So, Craig, is all of this that map, that's like the top of the hill where the Acropolis is, right? Um, actually, this is, if you look at a picture of Athens, you'll see these buildings, and then you'll see a higher hill above it. Okay. Above it, and there's like an old temple on top of that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be sharing a little bit. So, so where did Paul go? Um, some say he was right here in the Agora. It says so. Others say he went up on Mars Hill, on the Areopagus, on the high point. Um, it says that too. So um, there is a little bit of discussion. We'll, we'll look at that as we come. Look at verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a settler, setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. In the Agora, and I'm shooting for down below, okay? This marketplace where all the temples were, and he's looking at one, one idol after another, and people giving devotion to those. I believe he was down there and that he was speaking, publicly speaking, to a group of Jews who had probably already heard him in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And now they were here in the marketplace. And, oh, there that guy is again. You know, he's coming all the way from, from Judea. Good land. Let's, and people would gather around and listen. And he spoke to them. What language did he use? they probably would have been more comfortable if he used Greek. He would be absolutely comfortable to use Greek, wouldn't he? Yeah. Though he was born in a Roman city, Roman citizenship, we talked about last week, yet Tarsus spoke Koine Greek, the common Greek tongue. And wherever he traveled, he's speaking in Greek. So possibly he was speaking in Greek to these Jewish men instead of using uh, Hebrew or Aramaic. They wouldn't know Hebrew, but or they'd just be acquainted with reading of it, but Aramaic possibly. I think he was speaking in Greek. And as he's speaking in Greek, there's some folks listening in. Cool. He's cool. He's talking about religion and such. From the East. Whoa. You know, these Greeks, that was exciting. Hey, I wonder which God he's, he's uh, going to be speaking about. And certain Epicureans and certain Stoics were listening in on him. The Epicureans are a group of philosophers, are people who followed a philosopher. The philosopher was Epicurus. Epicurus lived about 341 to around 270 B.C., but there still was a school of Epicurean. Um, I got some fun stories, but I think I'll just leave it with the scripture because of the time. But the, uh, the Epicureans believed that the chief end of man is his own pleasure. And so you should do what feels right. Do what feels good. How do you know what to do or not? Well, how do you does it make you feel? Does that sound awful American? Um, how does it make you feel? Pleasure and happiness. 
but they had some guidelines, of course. Um, over the course of years, they, they put in guidelines. This pleasure, they believed, uh, should be obtained by avoiding excesses. Epicureans wouldn't just go out on a night for a drink, okay, and get drunk as a skunk. That is not pleasure for them because you had headaches afterwards, right? But if you could do something, go and let's eat. And let's eat like nobody's business. The finest food. You know a new restaurant? I heard of a new restaurant. And the Epicureans would be interested in eating and having pleasure that way. And they didn't like to talk about death. You don't mention death to Epicureans. The fear of death was just... A uh, place you just didn't go there. They sought tranquility. They sought anything that would give them freedom from pain. By loving one's fellow man, you can get a long ways in life. This is Epicurean thinking. They believe that if the gods exist, if they exist, they won't be interested in human affairs. We'd only grieve them. Right? So eat, drink, and be merry. And nobody talk about to what should happens tomorrow when you die. Okay? So that's the Epicureans. Then the others that are mentioned here are Stoics. You've heard that word used in regards to someone that's very serious, that doesn't seem to laugh a lot. He's a Stoic individual, we'll say. The Stoics were followers of a man by the name of Zeno. Z-E-N-O. Zeno um, lived way back at 320s um, to about 250s BC. And he used to teach in what was referred to as the painted colonnade. The word for colonnade, a whole bunch of columns, okay? Oh, you've seen, you've seen pictures of Greek buildings, right? A whole bunch of columns and such. Um, the Greek word for for colonnade is stoa, and so um, he taught in the painted stoas, and so consequently his people were referred to as the colonnade people. All right, the colonnade guys. Yeah, he's a colonnade guy. He's a Stoic. He's a person from the, the, um, the, col the columns. Um, they were pantheistic in their view. They liked a multitude of gods. Don't have one god. And this was very common to both Romans and to Greeks. They would link up with one particular god and that would be their god. And the army would have a particular, like Mithra, would have one god that they would follow and such. Well, Stoics didn't like that. Stoics felt it would be wiser not to make any gods upset. So be pantheistic. And, and get the word. If you write the word purpose in your notes, capitalize it. They continually talk about the great purpose that was directing history. When things would happen, you know, the Russians would invade the Ukrainians. They would say, this is according to the purpose. The great purpose. So you didn't have to really explain anything. Man's responsibility was to prepare himself. To align himself with the great purpose. And how he could do that? Handling tragedy. When horrid things happened, when somebody died in your family and such... This was a great time to get close to the purpose. And the Stoics prided themselves in this. In fact, that's the one thing when Stoics are addressed, the subject matter keeps coming up of pride because they considered themselves way smarter than those silly feast-eating Epicureans. They were much, much wiser. Stoics considered themselves the top. And in any discussion, they would almost back away from it and say, why should I wait my, waste my time? I'm a Stoic. I'm a follower of Zeno. When the philosophers encountered Paul, 
they began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler to say? Um, I use the word encounter because the King James ver- um, used the word encounter too in verse, uh, is it 18? And certain philosophers, Epicureans and Stoics, encountered him. That word encounter is this word, sumbalo, in the Greek language. And I said, anytime you look at a Greek word and there is a U, what do you make it into? And you usually can figure it out in English. Well, sim. Sim is together, right? And balo, you throw a Okay, so this is throwing back and forth. He throws the ball to him, he throws it back. But in words, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is a discussion. I used the word dialogue prior uh, prior to that. This symbolo is to toss something back and forth. Yeah, but have you considered this? Ah, yeah, but what about this? And they toss things back and forth in their discussion. That's the word encountered. And see how it reads so quite different in our English language when, when we don't know what that word means. The Epicureans and the Stoics tossed back and forth ideas, thoughts, philosophies with who? Paul. They got into the thing and started tossing back and forth um, thoughts. Some said, what will this babbler say? Others, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods. Why do you say that? Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. He's a babbler. Um, okay, you're probably going to miss what the... Let me just take this much of it. A babbler. The, Gre- the Greek verb that is, is used there is spermologos. Spermo, and there's an M in there. Spermo is the word for seed. Okay? This is for, like, for planting. Stuff like that. Um... Bushes throw off different different kinds of seeds. And logos is, of course, word. Um, so, um, what they were saying is, this man, this is literally how it comes into the English tongue. This man is a seed picker. He's a seed picker going around picking up seeds. They are thinking in their mind of a bird. You know, little sparrows. You see them out and they're picking up different seeds, stepping over others to pick up these and and pushing them out of your bird feeder to get the right one that they want. You know, that's that's what um, he's talking about, a seed picker. It's like birds pecking through things. Um, They're learning something here, and then they're learning something over here, and then they're picking up an idea over here. And they said, you know what this guy is? He just brings in little ideas over here and little ideas over there. Um, He's going to be hard to find. Another usage of that word of a seed picker is a loafer. A loafer. A slackered. Somebody that doesn't doesn't do anything. Um, you can use it for the word, our word sponger. Somebody, somebody that comes and just sees he can get a free meal here or free something here and he starts sponging off of other people. That's what they were calling him. What's this loafer? What's this worthless guy um, have to say? And others were saying, well, you know, I think he's talking about foreign gods. We should listen up on that. 
Why did they think? Because he was speaking of Yesuon, Kai or and, T Anastasin. He was speaking of Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus is in the masculine. Resurrection is in the feminine. Ah, he's talking about a god and a goddess. This Jesus, whoever he is, and this resurrection, whoever she is. They, they totally were not following. If you notice in verse uh, 31, skip down a little bit and see in verse 31. Because he had appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance to all men that he hath raised him, the man, Jesus, from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection, oh, he's using the word resurrection for this dead man coming back to life. <laughs> they laughed and walked away because they then realized he really was off the rocker. Verse 19 we read, And they took him, Paul, and brought him to Areopagus. This is the statement that causes folks to say, "Uh Uh-huh, it's not the Agora, but it's the hill above the Agora. Because he meets them in the Agora, and then he takes, and then they talk about this Mars Hill or this Areopagus, um, which is up above that. And so that's why people believe that much of the conversation that we see in this text and his sermon was given way on top of that hill. So is that the Acropolis? Um, or is that Acropolis. Some lower hill? That's a different word. Areopagus is the hill or the stone of Eris. Eris is Mars Hill, is what this is. And sadly, Mars Hill is not found in the Greek anywhere. It's Areopagus in both locations. And so if you have a modern translation, it probably um, indicates that. Um, So it appears that they took him, they brought him unto the Areopagus makes many scholars say, well, that means they went up onto the hill and said, may we know this new doctrine, this new teaching, whereof thou speakest. Verse 20 says, and thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know wherefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the strangers which were there spent their time at nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. They were hitting the news every day. Areopagus, Rock of Ares. uh, Traditional meeting place for the council of the Areopagus, the supreme body for the judicial and legislative matters in the city of Athens. In the first century, its power had really been reduced to an oversight of religious and educational matters. There's some question as to where this council met on this particular occasion. Some say up on Mars Hill, behind the Agora, immediately west of the Acropolis. Others say it met in a building in the Agora, which would probably be this temple of Ares that you see there um, in this corner of the of the uh, um, Agora. Um, in Athens, the ancient world intellectual center, Athenians loved to talk about the latest thing. Hey, did you hear? Is the favorite start for any conversation between these Greeks. In verse 22, we read, and when he had landed at, whoops, when he had turned the page, yes, turn it back, verse 22. And when Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious, which doesn't read very nicely in the King James. Um, 
it reads a lot nicer in, in the Greek. Meaning is this, um, well, actually, let me just first say, this is the beginning of another one of his sermons. There's about four sermons that are given to us in the book of Acts from Paul. And the thrust of this message, this sermon, get it, is very clear. A creator God who has revealed himself to the creation, that's you, has now commanded everyone, that's all of us, to repent for everyone must give an account to Jesus Christ whom God raised from the dead. End of the sermon. Paul began wisely by acknowledging to the Athenians that they were very religious. King James just simply says superstitious. Not a good translation. It comes from two Greek words. It's desidem, um, diamon, which is uh, the dedo, the first part of it, is to fear or respect or to revere. And diamon is deities, gods, or, if you will, demons. Let me show you this word. This is a part of that word. Diamon. When Paul says, you are, you are giving worship, first it says, you have given great reverence. I see you're giving great reverence to the Diamon. They're hearing him say, oh yeah, to Ares and to the other gods. Uh-huh. But what he hears himself say is that you are worshiping the demons, the spirits. And he says, I see you're very, very religious in this. The idea that the Athenians were, uh, the end of that word, back, by the way, is to be firm or to be strong. For the, for the Greeks to be firm and strong about their worship of the deities or the evil spirits. Um, that's a carefully chosen word. The men of Athens, thinking of the deities, but Paul subtly meaning evil spirits, demons. Because behind all idols, behind all false gods, are demons. Often on the mission field, we, we hear stories of individuals going into vil villages and actually face face off against these demonic spirits that are doing wonderful things for the villagers. And so the villagers give them great respect because of the things that those demons are doing. Demons can act like gods, but they always have one end and purpose, and that is to keep people away from the living God. Verse 23 says, this is the reason why he said that. He said, For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Oh, this is powerful. The Athenians who feared that they might overlook even one God, venerated every deity, and then covered those that they didn't know about. And they built an altar to the unknown God. By the way, that has been found. And that stone to the unknown God is in the Vatican Museum in Rome now. Because it's, to us as believers, a pretty remarkable piece of, of archaeology. They dedicated to the unknown God. Agnostotheo. Unknown God. Agnostotheo. Agnos, agnostic, agnostic. We use the word agnostic and we use the word atheist as if it was the same thing, and it isn't. An atheist without theo, without a God. An atheist believes there is no divine. But an agnostic, that guy you can win to Christ in a short order. Why? Because when he smiles and says, I'm an agnostic, he, he just said, come on, Christian, because I'm telling you, I don't know. 
agnosis. Ignorant is the word in the English tongue. I am ignorant is what an agnostic is telling you. He doesn't think so. He thinks he's being very philosophical. But what he's doing is saying, I don't know. And you say, ah. Let me, let me tell you about him that I have met. So he says, Agnostotheo, the unknown God, whom, and this is really cool, Agnoontes Usebeti, who you unknowingly worship. Doesn't come across in the English that way, does it? I'm going to tell you about this unknown, you've got this unknown God, this unknown God whom you unknowingly worship. How do we worship the unknown God? Well, they went and they would leave things at this altar. And he's saying, I know this God. Notice that when Paul refers to this, he didn't emphasize the altar but rather he emphasized the God that they were unknowingly worshiping. It's that unknown God that he was going to preach to them this afternoon. Verse 24 we read, God had made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and of earth, dwelling not in the temples made with hands. Because God made everything. He's supreme over all. The Lord of heaven and earth. Psalm 24, um, if you read that, it speaks on the same thing. He is Lord of all things, both in, in heaven and here on the earth. Such a great God doesn't live in temples. You can't cram him into a temple. He doesn't live in temples made with hands. And the Athenians crossed their heart, really believed that they did. That the God was present when they went into that temple. He's saying, no, he, he, he's the Almighty. He is supreme over all. Verse 25, look. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all, what? Life and breath and all things. God is above human temples, but he also is self-sufficient. He doesn't need human provisions. He doesn't require your offerings. This truth would appeal to the Epicureans. They'd be over there shaking their heads, yes. They believed that gods or gods existed, but they existed at another, another level than human existence. The last part of the verse, dealing with God's providing people with life and material things, suited the Stoic philosopher, aligning their lives with the great purpose. Remember? The purpose of the cosmos. Paul was thus beginning here where his listeners were and leading them from that spot to truth. Do you see that? He appealed both to the Epicurean and the Stoic leading them to the Creator God. Uh, Verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Last week I closed off our time together by asking you the question, how many races are there. And that's what you jumped in really, really quick, which is the biblical approach to thing. I looked up to see what our government has to say. The United States Census Bureau, um, the Office of Management and Budget, with standards on race, Ethnicity, which guide the Census Bureau. This is quote. This is straight. I just pulled it off off the screen. You can't make this stuff up. Said that there are white, a person have an origin of any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. 
black or African American, a person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa. Three, American Indian or elastic, um, Alaska Native. Did you realize that an Alaska Native was different than an Indian? That's all right. A person having origins in any of the original people of North and South America, including Central America, who maintain tribal affiliation or community attachment. In short, if you stop getting the Cherokee Tribune, you are no longer a Cherokee. Okay? As long as you keep the affiliation with the tribe, you are. But the moment you don't, my wife being one of them, who has Cherokee in her background and prides herself in that, has not been staying in it. Well, that's our government. Asian, a person having origins in any of the original peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, or Indian subcontinent, including, for example, <laughs> Cambodia, China, India, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Pakistan, the Philippine Islands, Thailand, and Vietnam. And then finally, the native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. The fifth is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Hawaii, Guam, Samoa, or other Pacific Islands. And in 2020, <laughs> our government said, you can self-identify with any one of them you want. <laughs> I ain't kidding. If you want to read it, okay, it's Aboriginal. pretty na nasty. And you can identify with more than one race. So when they ask you, you can mark whatever you want. Where did I find this? On the United States Census, Census Bureau's site. They, they list this down. Yeah, well... Um, it's cute. However, they think five races. You said one. What's your thinking? Um, well, the fact is, contrary to the Census of Bureau, um, Bureau of Census, I guess, Paul says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. That's the New American Standard, and it says one man. My King James says one blood. All it says is, and the word blood should be in italics, the word man should be in italics, it reads, and hath made of one all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Who is that one? that all nations come from. It's a man by the name of Adam and his wife Eve and all mankind. Everyone in this room is related to him. But you can go on further because there were several. He had a son that kind of went wayward and such and that whole tribal group died off. Probably were what um, European archaeologists refer to as Neanderthal. But after that was Noah and his wife and then his children Shim, Ham, and Japheth. And their wives understand? Noah and his wife, Shem and his wife, Ham and his wife, and Japheth and his wife. And now we go, oh, easy. The Shemites are the Semites. They're the Arabs and the Hebrews. The Hamites, that's easy. They're from Africa, and they're from Asia, and they're from um, they're Indians in the New World. And Jephite, that is Europeans. But what's wrong with that? Have you thought on it? Think how physically this is going to occur. Okay, so Shem and his wife has this son. Okay, have a son. 
and he sees this cute little girl. Well, it can't be a sister, right? That's a no-no. So it has to be a Japhite or a Hamite, right? That he falls madly in love with and marries. So from what tribe did these two come from? They came from Abraham. Noah and his wife. And that's what you have to say. The man? Adam. I said Abraham, didn't I? Adam. <laughs> and then Noah. And understand, each case, their wife. Um, oh, our time is really about... Here's some books that really you should have on your shelf, and I hope you'll get them. One Race, One Blood. Um, this is written by um, Charles Ware and Kenneth Ham. And they both trace their lineage back to Adam. But their picture on the back will let you know that there's some other changes that occurred over the course of years. You need to read this book. It's a beautiful book. And it goes into a subject that even this book goes into. This is Ray Stedman's book, The Beginnings. It's on the book of Genesis. And it goes into, whoa, what about Ham? Ham looked on his father. And there's a lot of question in regards. And so was he cursed? No. His fourth child, his youngest child, Canaan, was cursed. And so the curse of Ham has nothing to do with Asians and Africans. <laughs> As it seems to get in the scenarios, it makes it very clear it had to do with Canaan. And was Canaan ever, did they ever pay for that curse? Yes, when the Israelites came to the land, the Canaanites were there and they were to be God's intent, totally wiped out, every last one of them. Why? Because of the, the sin, uh, sexual sin of this particular man, Canaan, not so much of his father. You got to read it. When you see this, you'll, oh, it's good. It's good reading. Ah, I got to end. Okay, verse 27, we read, that they, should not, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. One of God's purposes is revealing himself to his creation, us. And history is a people would seek him, God, through his sovereignty he is also eminent, not far from us. He is close to us. And verse 28 said, For in Him, the Creator, we live and we move and have our being, as certain also of you, your own poets, have said, for we are also His offspring. To buttress this point, Paul apparently quoted from Epimenides, of all people, a Cretan poet, whom Paul quotes again in Titus chapter 1, verse 12, which makes you want to go out and get Cretan poetry books, doesn't it? For him to live and to move and have our being, the Creator inter interjects himself into our history. So Paul quoted the poet Erastus from Paul's homeland of Cilicia. We are God's offspring, he says. This second quotation. Um, the Athenians would have recognized immediately. Um, good enough. The Athenians' very creation and continued existence depended upon this one God whom they didn't even know, the unknown God. So such claim would ever be made of any person um, of the scores of false gods of the Greeks. Verse 29. For as much then as so the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver, stone or graven image or art or man's device. This conclusion is inevitable. Since humans have been created by God, he can't possibly be put into an idol of, of wood, stone, or what have you. 
but instead that word Godhead in the in the King James, uh, divine being, in the in the NIV, um, divine nature, in the New American Standard, is Theon, which best translation would be divine nature. It's used very very commonly in classical Greek, but this is the only time in the New Testament it's used, other than in Second Peter chapter one verses three and four used only in two places. This led Paul's logical conclusion in Romans. God made us in his image. It's so foolish for us to think we can make a God in his image. And we end, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man, Jesus, whom he hath ordained, wherefore, whereof he hath given assurance to all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard this, the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear this guy again, or hear this matter again. So Paul departed from among them. Albeit, certain men clave unto him, followed him, and believed, among which was Dionysus, an Areopagite. He's of the council that ruled on religion and education, and a woman by the name of Demarius. Was Paul's ministry at Athens a failure? You know, it's really difficult to assess There's no record of a church being founded in Athens because of this. Paul later refers to the household of Stephanos in Corinth as the very first converts, that is, first fruit of Achaia. Athens was in Achaia. Shouldn't these guys be listed as the first fruit? How could this be if some were converted in Athens? Probably the solution is found in thinking of Stephanos as the first fruits of the church of Achaia and then possibly the first fruit can include more than one person you understand Mm -hmm. the first fruit being from both towns if no church was begun in Athens the failure was not Paul's message it wasn't in his method but it was in the hardness of the hearts of the Athenians father thank you so much for giving us your word Thank you, Father, for allowing us to experience this that occurred so many thousand years ago, yet it's so relevant to what we're seeing right now when we turn on our TVs. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for these men who stand stand in this generation as light, lights to share your good news with others. This we pray in Jesus' own name. Amen. Amen.